President Donald Trump clearly equivocal about climate change. That won't be in evidence on Monday at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference, COP24. Joining me now via Skype from Seoul in South Korea is Nobel Laureate Emeritus Professor Rai Kwon Chung, former Principal Advisor on Climate Change to the UN Secretary General in South Korea, Climate Change Ambassador. He's also on the Global Energy Prize International Award Committee established by Vladimir Putin. Thanks for coming on the program, Ambassador. US President Donald Trump said to the Washington Post, when you're talking about the atmosphere, oceans are very small. Do you think he understands the kind of work you've done for the UN Secretariat in the past? Yeah, I think uh, many people have a different views, but uh, it is a collective wisdom of the global uh, community uh, that uh, climate change is real and happening. And uh, we just had a report from IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, last month, that uh, climate change is getting worse. And uh, we don't have to go to the report, actually. We felt it, you know, all around the world uh, last summer. And in fact, very interestingly, the number one country suffering from the damage from climate change, especially water-related disaster, was the United States, suffering from hurricanes. And it is also China and Japan are suffering most from the, the climate change uh, impact already. And it is not only flooding from water-related disaster, but also wildfire. California is suffering terribly already. So uh, this kind of uh, climate impact is already felt around the world. So uh, I don't think we have to dispute about it. I don't think uh, it is an issue of science, but it's an issue of uh, politics. And some people want to see the uh, downside of climate change, and some people want to see the you know, positive side of it. Because many people believe that climate action is going to damage uh, the economy. But there are some other people who are looking into the possibility that climate impact will, in fact, can open an opportunity for economic innovations and the new market and even economic growth and employment. So you see, with the Trump administration obviously now dismissing a report of 13 federal agencies with uh, 300 leading environmental uh, scientists, climate scientists contributing to it, is it up to BRICS countries to take the lead then? Yeah, uh, many countries, uh, including especially if you look at the Chinese role, China is now a leader of investment in renewable energy and all, uh, all uh, technological innovations are all also very interestingly coming from China for solar and wind. And they are the world leader, you know, the deployer of the capacity for renewable energy. And it is not only China. India is also catching up. And Brazil is also one of the leaders of renewable energy. And uh, also... Uh, the other countries are following these models. This is not because of, simply because of to save the world from climate impact, but it is because of the economic case that renewable energy is making. Because renewable energy is already approaching the price parity with the fossil fuel. And now they are even getting into the technologically mature stage where their grid parity is even comparable with the fossil fuel. So in many parts of the world, this renewable energy is already uh, appearing as a very serious alternative for renewable uh, fossil fuel, and they are even getting a, uh, delivering a ele electricity at a cheaper price. So it is because of the economic case, not because of only from the climate uh, uh, protections case. State mm -hmm. subsidy is uh, heavily involved now in these new projects, real Keynesianism. Just explain to me HVDC, which the European Union, I understand, a grant of maybe, I don't know, up to half a billion euros, the Asian Super Grid Project. We don't really hear much about these uh, initiatives here in uh, Britain. What are they? What is HVDC? In short, some people call it Super Grid, you know, in, in, because it is sending electricity across thousands of kilometers away, 5,000 or 7,000 kilometers away. This was uh, something uh, unimaginable some years ago because of the transmission loss. When you send electricity, you lose electricity. So the, uh, because of this kind of losses, it was not imaginable. But now, thanks to the new technology, high uh, directed volt uh, voltage techno current technology, we can send electricity thousands of kilometers without minima with minimizing you know, minimum electricity uh, transmission losses. So now we have a new technological tool on our hand which means that we can utilize many uh, desert areas and remote areas around the world, like Sahara Desert or Gobi Desert or even Central Asian uh, plains, 
can be turned into a powerhouse and they can transmit renewable energy across the world. So this uh, new technology, which is called the super grid, can play a very interesting role in stimulating the transition from the conventional fossil fuel economy towards a low carbon economy. So this is why even some businesses are interested about it. In fact, the first company in the world that has been promoting this super grid idea is a soft bank of Japan. And uh, the chairman Masayoshi Son has been promoting the idea of Asia super grid of linking Mongolia uh, to uh, China, Japan, and Korea. But uh, I am personally now proposing another idea of linking China, Central Asia, and Europe through Silk Road, which means that uh, I, I named it as a Silk Road Super Grid, which means that the Central Asian countries in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, all these countries can be turned into a powerhouse for renewable energy, and that they can send a large, huge volume of a gigawatt size of electricity to China, Japan, Korea, and Europe. So this will be a very interesting game changer and a paradigm shift towards a low carbon society. I mean, just to be clear, this is so revolutionary, one could foresee solar paneling the Sahara Desert and the whole of the world's energy needs would be from renewables. That's right. So, but before the reason, the Desert Tech, the, the name of the project was Desert Tech, which was uh, originated from Sahara Desert idea, was, didn't, make, didn't make much progress so far. Only reason was because of the technological problem of long distance transmission. But recently, during the last two to three years, now we have solved the technological problem of uh, transmission losses. This is why now many people are looking into new opportunity opened by this HDVC technology of sending electricity at long distances. So it's a matter of uh, not just a technological issue or economic issue, but it's a matter of political issue. Uh, as you can see in Sahara, I think there's a political issues. The, the reliability is in question. But uh, that's why I'm proposing uh, Silk Road Super Grid can be a very interesting, viable, and the fi politically feasible option for the countries in Europe and uh, the Far East for renewable energy transition. You see, I know Britain, 40,000 people may die this year because of particular pollution. But all we hear in Britain is that China is the polluting country. Beijing and Shanghai are terribly polluted cities, and that uh, Britain is in the lead of all of this. And Britain certainly hasn't publicly come out even for the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. So uh, you know, many people are uh, pointing the fingers for the air pollution in China. But you also have to note that Chinese government has been taking also very decisive actions. Uh, it is simply because of the huge scale of the air pollution issue. But uh, very interestingly, the trends of Chinese air pollution is uh, showing a dramatic improvement. People should look at the bright side and the silver lining because Chinese governments are very much aware about the issue and they are taking a very decisive actions on it. So I am more impressed by their very decisive action, which cannot be found in any other country around the world. Chinese are showing the most impressive example of clean energy and renewable energy leadership around the world. And they are even about 40% of total renewable energy investment is coming from China. So we have to see the you know, positive side as well, not only just a finger pointing the air pollution at the current stage. So in the long run, Chinese will make a very impressive improvement, which will be fastest in the history of human economic development. Okay, just very briefly now. Uh, perhaps even more fundamental than all of that is the ideas that uh, you wrote about in your greed growth concept. We've heard a lot from the Bank of England about Brexit here. Your economic uh, modeling software uh, would have to be very different, presumably, to the Bank of England right now. We may subsidize arms here. We certainly don't subsidize like your green growth concept. Can you just briefly outline it to us? Yeah, uh, I've been proposing the green growth idea, which was inspired by the Professor Paul Eakins in the uh, London Imperial College, and uh, the idea is that we can shift our tax base from income to air pollution and the natural resource consumption. Then we can have a double dividend, which means that we can lower the emission and we can stimulate the economic growth and jobs. This is a double dividend idea which has been promoted by many scholars. And the idea of green growth is to realize this double dividend idea. So when we have a proper 
uh, shifting or reform of our tax structures, then I think uh, our, our argument is that we can have or we can achieve the CO, low carbon transmission, transition as well as job creation and economic growth. So uh, many governments are these days, job creation is a number one priority. And I think uh, we need a proper tax reform, ecological tax reform. I think we can do it. Professor Rai Kwon-Jung, thank you. Well, UK...